we've seen many advantages to free trade in previous lectures, but as we all know, trade is often restricted. Let's see how this impacts a given market and why it is done. A tariff is a tax on an imported good that is imposed by the importing country. Tariffs raise revenue for governments and serve the self-interests of people who earn incomes in importing industries. The effect of a tariff can be shown on the graph as follows. Assuming we start from a bar barrier-free importing industry as shown on the graph, when the tariff is imposed, the world supply curve shifts upwards by the amount of the tax. This higher price reduces the quantity demanded of the good. The new quantity demanded is at the point where the new world supply curve intersects the demand curve. The higher price also induces domestic producers to produce more, and so the domestic supply increases. The new domestic quantity supplied is at the point where the new world supply curve intersects the domestic supply curve. The quantity of imports also shrinks from the orange arrow to the blue arrow. The government revenue can be calculated as the purple rectangle that is highlighted on the graph. It represents the total tax revenue that the government will earn. It is calculated as the quantity imported multiplied by the tax charge per unit imported. When we talk about gains and losses, we're going to take a look at the changes in the prices and quantities in the market. The changes that are brought about by the imposition of a tariff are quite significant. Domestic consumers lose out because they have to pay a higher price per unit of a good and are thus able to purchase less of it. Domestic producers gain because they are able to sell more of their product at a higher price. Foreign producers lose because they are unable to sell as much of their good as before. An import quota is a restriction on the quantity of a good that can be imported in a given period of time. This allows the government to satisfy the self-interest of people who earn from importing industries. Starting again at a market with free trade, when an import quota is imposed, we see a new supply curve. This supply curve has been moved horizontally by the quantity of the import quota. If the import quota is 5 units per year, then every point on the new supply curve will be 5 units to the right of the domestic supply curve. The new equilibrium price and quantity is at the point where the new supply curve intersects the demand curve. The price has clearly risen, and this causes a decrease in the quantity demanded. To find the new domestic quantity supplied, we find the point on the old domestic supply curve that corresponds to the new price. This is the new quantity supplied domestically. It has increased because the price has increased. The quantity of imports will also shrink. The new quantity of imports will, the, will be the amount of the quota imposed by the government. When we look at gains and losses, we will consider the new prices and quantities just like we did for tariffs. Domestic consumers lose because they fa face a higher prices and are thus able to buy less of the good. Domestic producers gain because they are able to sell more of the good for a higher price. Foreign producers lose because they are unable to sell as much of the good. Society as a whole also loses because of the inefficient allocation of resources. There are a few differences between a tariff and an import quota. A tariff brings in revenue for the government, which can be spent on improving infrastructure or providing other public services. A quota, on the other hand, increases profits for importers. Both are technically equivalent ways of restricting imports, meaning that using either would result in the same increase in price and decrease in quantity. Both also harm domestic consumers and benefit domestic producers. From what we've seen so far, using trade barriers results in an inefficient allocation of resources for society as a whole. So why do governments still impose these barriers? One argument states that sometimes trade restrictions must be put in place in order to help infant industries. Infant industries are new industries in a country's economy. The argument is that for the industry to become efficient, comparative advantage must be achieved. This can only be done through experience, which is hard to get if foreign competitors are able to supply the same good at a lower price. However, firms already benefit from experience even without protection and will become more efficient as time progresses. 
the overall social loss from trade restrictions might be greater than the potential benefit received from protectionism. Another argument made for protectionism is that it can be used to prevent something known as dumping. Dumping occurs when a foreign firm sells its exports at a price that is lower than its costs of production. Some firms try to use this as a method to drive all other companies out of business in order to establish a global monopoly. Once all other firms have gone out of business, the monopoly can charge a higher price. This is a generally justifiable argument for using protectionism, but the only problem is that it is hard to determine the cost of production of a firm, and thus it is very difficult to determine whether a firm is dumping or if it is simply efficient. The most prominent argument for protectionism is that it saves domestic jobs. There is the implication that free trade destroys jobs. This isn't entirely true. While free trade does destroy some jobs, it creates other ones. In doing so, the global labor force is allocated in the most efficient manner possible. Generally, more jobs are created due to free trade than are destroyed. For example, more jobs are created for importers and by association, retailers who sell imported goods. It is definitely possible to save jobs by using protectionism, but only specific ones could be saved, and that too at a very high cost. Similar to the previous argument, many people support protectionism because they believe that it will allow for better competition with cheap labor in other countries. The more expensive the labor used to make a good, the more expensive the good itself will be. Therefore, to allow domestic producers to compete, restrictions must be imposed. This argument is also not a strong one because of the following points. Firstly, the higher a worker's productivity, the higher their wage rate. Cheap foreign labor implies low productivity, and high domestic wages imply higher productivity. It is comparative advantage or the difference in opportunity cost that should determine which country should be tr producing a certain good, and not simply wage differences. Another argument for protectionism is that it provides an incentive to poor countries to raise their environmental standards. Free trade with rich countries is used as a reward to maintain its environment. The problem here is that poor countries cannot afford to be concerned about their environmental standards. The best way to improve the environment is to allow the population's income to grow. As income grows, people have the means and the desire to improve the environment. Income growth is supported by free trade, and thus imposing restrictions would have the opposite effect on the environment and would not help to improve environmental standards. It is claimed that free trade allows rich countries to exploit poorer countries' cheap labor. This is definitely a problem, but the problem is a short-term one. In the long term, free trade increases the demand for goods provided by a country. This increase in demand for the goods increases the demand for labor, which in turn increases the wage rate. Additionally, it is much better for a person in a poor country to have a low-paying job than no job at all. While it is not mor morally right, the alternative is much worse. There are many benefits to free trade, but not everyone benefits equally, or benefits at all for that matter. People who have invested in human capital, such as going to university, lose out when their jobs are outsourced offshore. Unemployment benefits do exist in the short term, but the acquisition of new skills is required in the long term. Governments can help by investing in human capital that promotes ongoing learning. We've seen a lot of reasons that explain why trade barriers cause inefficiency in the global economy, but at the end of the day, they still exist. Many governments of developing countries have a hard time collecting tax from their citizens because most economic activity takes place in underground markets. International trade activities, however, are properly recorded and can thus be taxed much easier. Another reason for restricting international trade is something known as rent-seeking. Rent-seeking is essentially lobbying for special treatment by the government to create economic profit for certain firms. A lot of times, the firms that lose out when free trade is allowed lose a lot. Few, few firms each lose a lot of potential profits. However, the gains from free trade, despite being very large, are spread out over a large number of people. Thus, each person gains little. That was the lecture on international trade.